Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, PBM, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Marks Paneth, Capital One Bank. Additional funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, Bank of America, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kesmatidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, People's United Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, and these friends. I am very fortunate today to have Bruce Shanzer, who's the president and CEO of Cedar Realty Trust, who has a very interesting life story, especially to talk about his father and his uncle. Bruce, thanks for being here today. Great to be here with you, Michael. Thanks for having me. So tell me about your father and your uncle who were born in 1935 in, in, in France. Sure. So they were, they were actually born, they were born in Liège, Belgium, uh, and they moved to France in 1940, they actually fled to France in 1940 uh, when the Nazis invaded Belgium. Uh, and they fled to the south of France to a part of France that was known as Vichy France or Free France. Uh, and they settled uh, in an industrial town in the south of France called Saint Etienne. And they lived there for a number of years until uh, the Vichy government started uh, being complicitous uh, with the Nazis uh, that led to my grandfather, their father Bruno, uh, being arrested. He was then held in a, a prison camp that the French operated called Drancy, uh, and he eventually was deported to Auschwitz where he was murdered. But you were saying to me when we spoke on the phone that the, the early years in Belgium were fine. I mean, that's right. The family was comfortable. They had a good life over there, uh, and they had to move and find different places. Let's talk about those things. Sure, sure. My father and my uncle, they're twins, they're twin brothers. They lived for the first five years of their life a relatively conventional existence in Belgium. Their mother was a stay-at-home mom. Their dad worked in a factory that was owned by their uncle Max that made bicycles. And when the Nazis, when the Germans invaded in 1940, they fled to St. Etienne, as I mentioned, where again, things were relatively peaceful for a couple of years. It was a relatively typical youth and the way my father, my uncle described it, and certainly even knowing them now at the age of, eight, of 86, it's not hard to imagine they were very spunky kids, they were mischievous, uh, and they were very fun loving. And so is, as they described it, uh, it was a fairly conventional, actually fun childhood, of course, interrupted when they had to leave Belgium, but otherwise uh, relatively typical for what a child might have experienced even uh, in today's day and age up until, uh, again, things started to heat up in, in Vichy, France. Let's talk a little bit about the relative who was in Detroit, Michigan. Ah, it's, a, it's a great story. So I mentioned how my uncle... I'm sorry, pardon me, how my grandfather Bruno had worked at uh, my Uncle Max's bicycle factory. My Uncle Max was a very industrious fellow. And he had gotten an engineering degree uh, at the University of Grenoble and then went to go work for Henry Ford in Detroit. Uh, and Henry Ford was a notorious anti Semite, had apparently published Mein Kampf, Hitler's uh, book that 
described as anti-Semitic intentions. And Max came back to Europe, as I had been told, and warned the family uh, about Hitler and what was, uh, you know, what appeared to be coming uh, down the road. My grandfather, who was of German descent, Bavarian, uh, and couldn't imagine the Germans uh, being this way, poo pooed it. My grandmother, who, as Max's sister, uh, who grew up of Polish descent and had seen a lot of anti Semitism over the years, uh, did believe it, but ultimately they did not follow Max, who returned back to the United States and ultimately was able to avoid uh, you know, the Holocaust by. by uh, having returned to the U.S. Let's talk about the Catholic orphan, orphanage. Uh, the, so that's an amazing story. My father uh, and my uncle, after my grandfather was arrested and deported, uh, my grandmother was scrambling. She uh, didn't know what to do uh, with, her, with her sons. Uh, and eventually was able to connect with the French underground. The French underground took them out of a, a, out of a house where they were being uh, maltreated and kept them in an orphanage that was associated with a church. The experience that they described is really something right out of a movie. The uh, orphanage was across the street from the church. Every day they would leave the orphanage, they would go across the street uh, to the church to pray. Uh, they, they tell the story about how uh, when everybody else would go on two knees, they would go on one knee and how they would skip rosary beads uh, because they still saw the connection to their Jewish heritage. One day they're crossing the street and somebody comes up to them and says, I have a message from your mother tomorrow, wait at the back of the line. Uh, and so the next day they're crossing the street from the orphanage to the church. They are at the back of the line and two men come over, grab their hands and walk off with them. Uh, and they, uh, of course, never returned to the orphanage. And that was uh, the French underground. And eventually they placed uh, my father and my uncle in, in another location, uh, which remarkably enough, my grandmother was not made aware of in order to avoid them being caught uh, in the event that she was arrested. Let's talk about the dress shop. Ah. My, my grandmother, uh, her name was Bella, Bella Ein Shanzer. She, she had a relationship with a woman who owned the dress shop. When my grandfather had already been deported and now my father and my uncle uh, were being held by the underground and, and she had no idea where they were. She was, as you can imagine, just at her wits end. And uh, she encounters uh, Jean Bonhomme and uh, is asking, you know, what's wrong? And she uh, confided in her about her situation. And uh, Madame Bonhomme responds to my grandmother and says, of course, have the boy stay with my daughter, with Adolphine Dorel. And that's in fact what happened. And so my father and my uncle uh, ended up uh, moving in with Adolphine Dorel, who uh, they came to know as La Meme. Uh, which means grandmother, and it's interesting, all these years later, uh, she is known as La Meme within my family. In other words, she is known as uh, a grandmother within our family and as somebody who we have tremendous love and affection for. And it all started at that dress shop where my grandmother uh, used to go to get tailoring done uh, before uh, things heated up in, in Vichy, France. So the story about the castle. Another one of those amazing, right out of a movie type of stories. So my grandmother, uh, once she had gotten her sons safely uh, settled uh, with Adolphine Dorel, uh, found refuge in a castle uh, in a town called Verrieux, essentially a town that sat around the castle that was owned by the Marquis and the Marquise de Verrieux, uh, who were French royalty or nobility uh, for uh, over a century. Uh, de Verrieux were working with the French underground trying to help Jews who were trying to escape uh, deportation uh, or arrest, uh, or de Verrieux, I should say, helped my grandmother get false papers. She became known as Marie de l'Héritier, de and she moved into the castle. Uh, and she lived in the castle as a maid for a number of years until uh, the Verriers were denounced 
uh, and my father and my uncle and my grandmother all have to flee uh, and they hide in a, in a barn. Uh, and my father described this incredibly scary couple of days where they're hiding uh, on the, in the mezzanine of a barn, uh, trying not to make any noise and they're you know, relatively young children with bats flying around uh, and no food as they wait out the, the storm. So let's talk about the war is over. How do your father and uncle come over to America? It's a terrific story. It's a classic uh, story of people, Jews, who came to the United States after the Holocaust. My father and my uncle came along with their sister, Anna, who was a year older than them, uh, their mother, who had survived, and also a cousin, Jack, whose parents had been murdered in Auschwitz and who unfortunately was mentally ill. They moved in amazingly enough, and this is just you know, the kind of immigrant story that uh, it's hard to relate to nowadays. They, the five of them moved into a one room SRO apartment in the, on the Lower East Side. My father recounts how there was a bathroom, uh, I'm sorry, pardon me, a bathtub in the middle of the room, uh, but the bathroom was in the hallway and at night they would, you know, if they had to go to the bathroom, they would leave the SRO room, they would, they were, they were, you know, in the winters especially, you'd have homeless people sleeping in the hallways and they would, uh, you know, have to make their way around these people, but they settled in. My grandmother uh, joined the Furriers Union and she worked as a furrier. She also hustled uh, and did various things uh, to make money. Uh, and uh, at the same time, my father and my uncle received a scholarship to go to RJJ, to the Rabbi Jacob Joseph Yeshiva, you know, they arrived, they didn't know any English. Uh, and by the time they graduated RJJ, they were at the top of their class. Uh, and it really is a classic American, you know, early immigrant success story. They then went to City College, where my father studied pre-med courses. My uncle studied engineering. Uh, my father then went to medical school uh, and eventually uh, studied neurology uh, and practiced neurology, you know, just retired very recently. And went my to medical school in Europe, right? He went to medical school in Belgium and then he did his neurology training back in New York. Uh, and my uncle studied engineering and, and studied law uh, in New York and eventually went, um, went on to be a patent attorney. Now, one of the comments that your dad, who until recently just retired from practicing medicine at 86, said, right. my vocation is my avocation. That's right. Here, I'm 52 years old, so I still have a lot of career ahead of me. Um, you know, I'm very grateful that you've had me on this show. And you know, certainly, you know, my having I guess, become the CEO of a New York Stock Exchange listed company is a nice professional accomplishment. What's amazing is literally everything I've accomplished uh, is really a credit to my father, who just brings such a unique approach to life. Uh, he lives his life with tremendous joy uh, and just humanism. And certainly one of the hallmarks of his existence is that he was a physician up until very, very recently, a neurologist, and he loved what he did. He loves life. Uh, and you know, being a doctor, you really care for people when they're most vulnerable and when they really need somebody who just is going to be supportive and warm and caring. And, you know, my dad really has that type of human quality. And he often would say, as you remarked, that his vocation is his avocation. In other words, his job is his hobby. He loved what he did. And it's largely because he's somebody who lives joyfully and really loves people. And so the idea of having a job that involved caring for people and investing and injecting his warmth into them to help them feel better and feel cared for was just something that came very naturally and comes very naturally to him. How did your mother and father meet? Uh, my mother uh, unfortunately passed away, but my mother was also a physician. Uh, she was an ophthalmologist and they met when they were in training. My father was the chief resident and my mother was uh, a more junior resident and my father uh, who it was and is very charming. And my mother, who is a wonderfully uh, attractive and vivacious woman, uh, you know, she was probably charmed a little bit by, the, by this fellow with the French accent, uh, but they met and you know, 
fell in love. And she uh, came from a totally different background, right? That's right. That's right. A very unusual combination on certain some levels. Uh, you know, much in the way my father's story is that classic European immigrant story. My mother's is uh, is more of a classic American Jewish story. Her family uh, is uh, is a is a German Jewish family that lived on the Upper East Side, uh, named Danziger uh, and Bernstein, uh, and uh, she grew up in a very, very assimilated Jewish family, uh, one in which uh, her parents were probably more upset that she married uh, a Jewish immigrant than uh, they were that uh, the other sons uh, didn't even marry Jews. Um, and certainly, uh, they, my, my parents had a beautiful and warm marriage, but certainly one of the challenges that they faced was this integration of uh, uh, an Orthodox Jewish man uh, marrying a woman who was really unaffiliated, uh, although, although she was Jewish. Uh, and so certainly that was one of the challenges uh, in their marriage. And, and one of the hallmarks of my childhood was you know, sort of uh, working through uh, those two uh, worldviews. Let's talk about growing up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, the home of the builders, as we would say, ah. many of them who were saved by Schindler's List. That's right. That's right. So grew up, grew up in Elizabeth. My mom and dad both moved there. It was a great place to be a doctor. Very working class town, interestingly. So really not a, a town that was affluent at all. We grew up literally a block away from Section 8 housing. Uh, but what was amazing about Elizabeth was the fact that uh, there were, as you mentioned, about half a dozen incredibly successful real estate developers, even back then, we didn't even appreciate how successful they were until we left Elizabeth and you know, started reading about them. Names like Kushner, who obviously has become very prominent through the Trump presidency, the Wilfs, who owned the Minnesota Vikings, the Halpern family, and then all of the builders who uh, were saved by Schindler's List, uh, Pantera, Zuckerman, Levenstein. These were incredibly significant real estate developers uh, who all happened to live in Elizabeth, and they all followed Rabbi Pinchas Tights, who had founded the, the Jewish Educational Center, which was the school and the synagogues in Elizabeth. And so what's interesting about that is that I look, you know, my brother and I are both in real estate, and there's no doubt that having grown up in Elizabeth, where, again, there weren't big Wall Street types or anything like that, really the people who were the most successful people in our town were, as you mentioned, the builders, the real estate developers who were very charitable, very successful, very interesting people. And certainly, I think that growing up, I always thought to myself, you know what, I wanna go into real estate and be successful just like them. And certainly that was, uh, they, were, they were certainly role models for us. So you graduated high school. During, during growing up, you did work part-time for the builders, as you said, right. and you learned from the ground up being on the construction site. That's right. So how did you decide to go to Yeshiva College? After high school, I spent a year studying in Israel. And I, it's a, sort of a classic type of a move for a lot of kids leaving Jewish day schools. And, and while I was there, I, I, I recognized that I wanted to continue to be a committed Jew. As I, as I described to you growing up, there was certainly uh, a crossroads where I could have sort of gone down the path that my mother uh, was on and been less religious or gone down the path that my father was on and been more religious. I, I guess I decided to pursue the path of being a little bit more of an observant Jew. And so Yeshiva College is a very logical way to go so that I could uh, study Jewish uh, topics and secular topics. Ended up getting a terrific education there, had a wonderful experience, had the opportunity to go on an accelerated entry program from Yeshiva College into Cardozo Law School. So after, uh, so, uh, so after uh, three and a half years of college, was admitted to an accelerated program at Cardozo that allowed me to complete college and law school combined in about six years. Uh, it happens to be that when I was in, uh, when I was younger, I'd skipped the grade as well. So it ended up working out well because I was a relatively young uh, attorney. I, I started practicing law when I was uh, just, I just turned 24. Uh, and that in turn gave me the flexibility to make some changes uh, later on in my career uh, that we'll probably touch on. One of the interesting things that happened from that is that the builders helped you, correct? That's right. That's a, that's a great story. Uh, it's funny. Uh, 
when I graduated from law school, I was really intent on becoming a real estate attorney. As you, as I mentioned, you know, I really had a real passion and interest in real estate and wanted to be a real estate attorney. It was 1993. It was in the middle of the uh, RTC uh, liquidation phase. Real estate was really in disfavor. It's very hard to get a job. And I found this firm, Brock Eichler in New Jersey, uh, that had a lot of real estate attorneys. They were the law firm that the Kushners used. And when I met with the managing partner, when he heard I was from Elizabeth, he said, you know, I'm going to call Ray Kushner for a recommendation. And he did. And it was reported back to me that apparently Ray Kushner, may she rest in peace, said, give him a job. He's a nice boy. So they gave the job to the nice boy. You practiced law for a couple of years. And then you and your bride with they have one child uh, over there, decided to go to Chicago to Booth That's right. Business School. That's right. So my wife, Jill, uh, who's been an incredible support and life made for the last 27 years, I uh, supported a decision to leave law. I was kind of on the partner track. I'd already been practicing law actually for six years. I uh, had one child. Uh, we had another one on the way. Uh, and we relocated to Chicago. I went to the University of Chicago. We had, we, by the time I graduated, we had another child uh, in utero. And, uh, and came back to, to New York, and I, I had a job waiting for me at Merrill Lynch. Uh, in their so let's estate. talk about Merrill Lynch and Goldman before we get to Cedar. Sure, sure. So I uh, worked at Merrill Lynch, interestingly worked on the Cedar IPO, uh, and then uh, had the good fortune to move over to Goldman uh, after six years at Merrill, uh, and did a four-year stint at Goldman, a really just a terrific, terrific experience, both at Merrill and at Goldman, made terrific relationships and had a really very significant formative experiences at both of those firms that just helped build the foundation for, for what ended up being the, the current position that I'm in at Cedar. So how did you make the decision? You know, you were, you were at Goldman, you were working 24-7, which was part of the reason, I think, that you wanted to see the kids. How did you decide to make the turn to become the president and CEO of a publicly traded REIT? Well, certainly one of the things is the opportunity presented itself, but certainly I was having a wonderful run at Goldman and I didn't really have an eye on the door by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I was mindful at that time. I had four children. My oldest was in eighth grade. I was, as you mentioned, traveling a lot. And uh, I, I was thinking that I really needed to ideally find a job that while continuing to challenge me would allow me to, to restore a little bit of the work-life balance and be able to invest more time in my children and raising them. And certainly that was one of the things that drew me to Cedar was that I would have a little bit more autonomy over my time. And it was a good decision from that perspective. Again, I was really able to, and I continue to be able to have a, really a much more active hand in in raising my children and investing time in, in them on a daily basis, which is really been invaluable. Let's, let's talk about your role at Cedar. You've been here 10 years, correct? So I've been at Cedar for 10 years. Uh, we've had a terrific run. Uh, I succeeded Leo Ullman, uh, who was the founder of the company and a very vibrant, energetic, dynamic individual. Uh, he really uh, left the company that uh, had a very solid foundation from a cultural perspective in terms of uh, a significant diversity, a very family-friendly environment, a place uh, that has a lot of warmth. And I've tried to maintain that in terms of, again, maintaining a degree of diversity, equality, and opportunity uh, for people who work there. Uh, the changes that I've made uh, since succeeding Leo was really to focus the company. Uh, we've really become much more focused, uh, fewer assets uh, with more of a grocery anchored focus, and then also We've built out uh, a redevelopment program that's very exciting, where we're redeveloping a number of open air shopping centers into mixed use projects with a real focus, uh, which is incredibly meaningful on more challenged urban markets in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, where we can do things like help people access fresh food and better health care alternatives than they currently have available to them. And it really is very much in the spirit of both this mantra that we talked about at Cedar doing well while doing good and also on a more personal level uh, trying in a corporate environment to maybe uh, live out a little bit of what as we described earlier are some of the examples the first of all the righteous individuals who saved my family and then the example of my father and may he live and be well who has spent his career caring for people and really trying to make their lives better. 
with like a minute and a half left. Talk to me about Jill and the kids. Ah, so again, uh, Jill, my wife of 27 years, you know, I did give a lot of credit to my dad. I should certainly, of course, recognize that she has been an incredible friend uh, and I really hit the jackpot uh, from that perspective and it's undeserved. I was a child almost when I married her and she really has made me into a man and I give her a lot of credit for, uh, for everything that she's done and helping me grow up and uh, certainly as a life partner, you couldn't ask for anybody better and she's a fantastic mother to our children uh, and I'm very proud of my children. My oldest is named Jesse. Uh, he's 23, my daughter Ellie, who's uh, named after my mother Ellen, uh, and my son Judah, who is, actually Ellie is 20 today, uh, my, my, my son Judah is 18, and my youngest Akiva is 16, and again, it's just a, it's a wonderful family, and Jill and I really enjoy, uh, have been enjoyed raising them, uh, and I, I think that if you were to ask them, I think they enjoy being in the Shanzer family, it's just, we're, we're a pretty fun bunch. So it's wonderful that your father and your uncle were able to come to America, the innovation, the creation and everything. And as you say, the vocation and avocation are there. And thanks great for being job. here today and see you again on my shows. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here and I'm honored to have been asked to join.